Well, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Jeff Rathke. I'm the president of the American German Institute at Johns Hopkins University. And we're delighted to be able to present uh, today's discussion, uh, a book talk by Professor Joyce Mushaben of What Remains, The Dialectical Identities of Eastern Germans. And I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Dr. Eric Langenbacher, who is the director of our Society Culture and Politics program here at AGI, and he's going to lead us through the event. So, uh, Eric, uh, please take it take it away. Thanks, Jeff, and welcome, Joyce. We're really thrilled that you're able to join us today to talk about your um, great new book. Um, so, what we'll do today is uh, Joyce will start with a presentation um, of uh, the arguments, the main findings of the book. And then we'll open up to a discussion, a Q&A session afterwards. I would ask everybody to please uh, type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That way I can com combine questions and, and everything like that. Uh, but before I hand the floor over to Joyce, let me introduce her just a little bit. I know that she's well known to all of you, but it's um, uh, uh, good to be reminded of her many achievements. She's a Curator's Distinguished Professor of Comparative Politics Emerita at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, as well as an adjunct faculty member uh, currently in the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, Joyce has spent almost two decades living and researching uh, in Germany with a wide variety of foci over the years, social movements such as peace, ecology, and feminism, and a nuclear protest neo-Nazi activism, German national identity, generational change. She's also working on U European Union developments involving women's leadership, gender policies, citizen migration, and asylum policies. Uh, she received her PhD from Indiana, Indiana University back in the day, and has also had a variety of um, important grants and fellowships from the DAD, the German Marshall Fund, the von Humboldt Foundation, uh, and she's also, I should add, um, a former uh, fellow, a Ford Foundation fellow, actually, here at the American German Institute, back when we used to be the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. And she also was, I think, the very first research fellow in the Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown. That's before, of course, it became the BMW Center. She's had visiting professorships at Ohio State, Washington University, St. Louis. She's been a Fulbright lecturer in Erfurt. Um, and also at universities in Stuttgart, Tübingen, and Berlin. So without further ado, Joyce, the floor is yours. Thank you for welcoming me back home, so to speak. Indeed, I feel like with this book, I have pretty much closed the circle because when I first came to what was then AICGS in May of 1989, I was very interested in writing about East German identity because my first book had concentrated on the impact of generational change on West German identity. And the question I was posing to myself in both of these instances was whether or not 40 years of division had resulted in the formation of separate identities for the Germans of East and West, or whether it was perhaps possible that the historical bonds of national consciousness had transcended the horrors of war, the ignominy of defeat, and of course, the imposition of diametrically opposed socioeconomic systems. Now, someone I had interviewed for my first book on West German identity, Theo Sommer, said to me during the summer of 1989, Joyce, there is no such thing as an East German identity. And less than six months later, the wall had fallen. And ever since that time, we've discovered he was absolutely wrong. Now, this book is divided into three parts, and I will now go over directly to the PowerPoint in order to show you what are the sort of big theoretical or conceptual themes that are driving this book. And then I hope we'll have at least more time in the discussion to talk about some of the individual subcultures that I cover. What Remains is divided into three parts. And I would say uh, the most important distinction I need to make at the very beginning is the difference between DDR identity, state-defined identity, officially defined 
imposed actually from the top down versus what I call Ostdeutsche identity, the everyday identity of Eastern Germans or what Christiana Lemke had referred to back then as peer culture. And this is where I think Theo Zummer and everybody else got it wrong. They simply assumed that the only identity that was allowed to exist within the GDR was the official DDR identity. And this one fell apart as we will see pretty quickly. So the first section of my book talks about this kind of distinction, how official identity was configured, how the state sought to impose it on all of its citizens over a span of some 40 years, actually covering three generations. And then the next thing I pick up in the book is I revisit this theme of exit voice and loyalty. Now, there were a bunch of people, including uh, Alberto Hirschman, Christian Jopke, who kind of jumped on that bandwagon immediately after the wall fell to say, well, this is clearly the fall of the wall and the outpouring even back then across the green border in Hungary. This was clearly a case of exit and they didn't have any voice and surely there would not be any kind of loyalty left to the system. And I argue that they aren't looking into the detailed elements of East German society. Very few of those authors were familiar with the GDR from the inside out, and therefore I develop a much more extensive framework. And I argue that each group, in fact, subcultural group, developed its own forms of exit, of voice, and that leaves behind the critical significance of loyalty. So what remains is divided into these three parts. Then I pick up the impact of public policy on each of these subcultural identities, which I'll elaborate on in a bit. Then I talk about the loyalty dilemmas that remain sort of in normative terms, not systemic loyalty, but what I would call normative loyalty, because I think a lot of people had internalized some of the values and obviously appreciated some of the policies, job security, guaranteed childcare, et cetera, that they thought would carry over into the new system. And I, in the subcultural chapters, I look at who were the winners, who were the losers at all three stages before, during, and after unification all the way up until roughly 2020. And finally, I address the issue of coming to terms in West Germany with the East German past. Now, as I said, the book is divided into three parts. The first section explores the historical and the national components of GDR identity as it was officially defined and propagated over a span of some 40 years. The second part analyzes major fact factors that contributed to a growing gap between the national consciousness that was espoused by the socialist leadership and average citizens' willingness to embrace the official version of GDR identity prior to the fall of the Berlin Wall. It explores the transformation of identity among former GDR state officials, party functionaries, and what we could call the true believers. The third section then shifts to the unofficial dimensions of East German identity, which imprinted themselves on the day-to-day -day personal consciousness of specific subsets of citizens as a key to understanding, in the words of Christa Wolf, was bleibt or what remains. These chapters explore an array of erroneously conflated subcultures. I handle in very different ways, writers, intellectuals, pastors, dissidents, women and youth, and then turn to working class men whose identities in more recent years have been marked by alienation and hostility since the uh, implosion of 1990, which has attracted them to the right wing populist alternative for Germany party. The concluding chapter focuses on the values and the identities of post-wall youth, what one the first group called itself uh, third generation East, dritte Generation Ost, and now we have the Nachwende Jugend. Now it's a little bit complicated here because the people who were children or teenagers at the time the wall fell are now 40 somethings. And so I try to explore the extent to which some of those internalized values have persisted, how they've sought to reconfigure their identities over the last 30 years. <clears throat> My core argument here is that 
the rediscovery of personal East German identities, a process mockingly referred to as Ostalgie, is not an attempt to paint the GDR past as a golden one, nor are former citizens merely trying to exonerate themselves from complicity with what was a, admittedly a very authoritarian regime. I see the rediscovery of differences among German citizens East and West today as fulfilling a fundamentally necessary purpose. The renewed search for an East German identity is one phase of a process of taking pieces of the old life a multitude of familiar cultural norms, practices, behaviors, and taste, the habitus, as Bourdieu would say, and reassembling them, reconfiguring them into new nodes and networks. In other words, it's a search for new forms of social capital and another way of describing their loyalty to things that were part of their everyday life, even their taste in the old system that would now lend themselves to more effective use under new institutional conditions and new socio-psychological imperatives. Now, as you can see here, I've already distinguished between DDR identität and Ostdeutsche identität. The GDR population never comprised a homogeneous mass marching to the formation of or to the beat of a socialist drone. The SED had to cater to a variety of citizen groups, some of which benefited more than others at different times and in diverging ways. Correspondingly, <coughs> excuse me, the cost and benefits of unification were neither spread equally across the new lender, nor were they randomly allocated. Now, you will see from this brief summary, this is part of my larger framework that I actually developed when I was back at the AICGS in 1989. So I was already anticipating the idea that there were these subcultures, that each of these societal groups, whether it's the dissidents, the writers, the intellectuals, the, the women on an everyday basis, they came up with various forms of exit. And this was completely overlooked by the people writing back in 1989. People would talk in the GDR a lot about innere migration, uh, creating the niche society, the little Schrebergarten societies that they had, the alternative culture that evolved in Prenzlauer Berg. All of these were ways of kind of walking away from the system, and therefore I think they can be construed as a form of exit. My youth chapter is particularly fun to read because I talk about the skins, the punks, the grufties, the Christians, the normalos, and all these other little weird subcultural groups that emerged over time in the GDR. The states, uh, according to Hirschman, the, it's, it, it's a lovely, it's a very simplistic paradigm, and it's useful for experts who are trying to explain cycles of decline and recovery. And its metaphorical qualities have led many, including Hirschman, to simply explain the breathtaking turnaround of 1989-90. According to Hirschman, exit ceases to exist as a real option when it ceases to exist as a real option, and certainly the construction of the Berlin Wall put an end to that. Voice is expected to carry the entire burden of alerting, alerting management to its failures. Yet voice was also an option denied to most citizens under an authoritarian regime, at least as we interpret this in the West. And there is this real bias in Hirschman's study and the paradigms most people use towards Western democratic free market oriented societies. And therefore they didn't see any need to look further. From an Eastern vantage point, one could argue that exit overrode the exercise of a particular kind of voice. The regime sought to rid itself of potential critics and rabble-rousers who more often than not were willing and eager to exit, especially after imprisonment for attempted flight. SED officials viewed forced exit as an efficient mechanism for disposing of dangerous voices or incorrigible class enemies. But this practice lost much of its effectiveness by the mid-1980s. The state's monopoly over exit rights impelled millions of others to discover new ways of expressing their discontent 
without denying themselves whatever benefits the system continued to offer, job security, extensive maternity leave, and a clean historical slate vis-a-vis -vis West Germany, at least in theory. As originally conceptualized, loyalty was assigned a secondary role in individual responses to decline. It was deemed significant only to the extent that it either inhibited or promoted a willingness among citizens and consumers to notify key decision makers of critical lapses in performance. The loyalty dilemmas that were inherent in verordnete antifascismus is also linked to problems of generational change. FRG politicians and citizens in the West assumed that East Germans would immediately jettison their own values, behaviors, and political orientations to embrace the Western way of life. But here is where they failed to distinguish between systemic loyalty involving the officially mandated GDR identity, its institutions and policies, and what I label normative loyalty, reflecting personal identities, value preferences, behaviors shared with families, friends, and work colleagues, or again, I come back to the idea of peer culture. As this book demonstrates, it was sooner the absence of systemic loyalty, which fueled a propensity for new kinds of voice, especially among the GDR successor generations, and with that, the persistence of normative loyalty after 1990. And that explains why there is still such a thing as an East German identity. Now, despite their unhappiness with everyday uh, propagandistic educational processes, even radicalized youth internalized many of these socialist ideals, indicating the deeply rooted nature of loyalty that was largely ignored by Hirschman. Voice and exit behaviors, by contrast, tend to be context specific and thus subject to greater change over time. Now, I also spend some time discussing what price loyalty could be made, at what price loyalty could be maintained. And certainly for each generation, loyalty holds a very different price. And also it has a very different foundation. Now, what we will see, um, in the, in, I'm just gonna stop the PowerPoint at this point and continue talking. These everyday subcultures, GDR writers and intellectuals, Stasi agents, pastors and dissidents, women, youth and working class men, their identities were all defined by the specific policies addressing each and every group. But I think ultimately, there were winners and losers spread across the process of unification. So there was a kind of bonding experience because they thought they were going to be winners and immediately began to perceive themselves as losers. Let me offer you two, three major justifications as to why the GDR population in general felt like losers when they should have been winter winners in the immediate post-unification period. First of all, there was the experience with the toy hunt, which is also referred to as the bad bank of privatization memories. By 1994, over 40,000 enterprises had been liquidated or privatized, resulting in job losses for 72% of the 4.1 million people who had labored there. West Germans assumed ownership of 85% of the productive companies. They control 51% of the firms, they gained access control over 64% of the sales volume and 68% of the remaining workplaces. East Germans secured less than 6% of the people's own factories and businesses. Foreign investors managed to grab 10%. Over 2.3 million FRG men, West Germans, moved eastwards to occupy the top administrative, political, and economic posts. Which brings us then to a study conducted by Michael Blum and Olaf Jacobs in 2016 regarding elites in unified Germany almost 30 years after unification had occurred. Easterners comprise 17% of the population, but as late as 2016 occupied only 1.7% of the 15,000 
top level post at the federal level. That year, there were three out of 60 state secretaries from the East, only two of 200 Bundeswehr generals and admirals. The share of top positions in their own state governments had dropped from 75 to 70 percent over the previous 12 years. The regional presence of state secretaries did rise from 26 percent to 46 percent. But Easterners held only 5.9 percent of all chief justice slots, although their total share of judgeships in Germany had risen to 13 percent 30 years after unification. Twice as many Westerners were still serving as rectors and provosts at higher educational institutions in the Eastern states. By 2020, Easterners were only one of seven directors at key research institutions. Among the 13 largest newspapers in their own region, their share of chief executives dropped from 36% to 9% of regional newspapers in the East. Easterners accounted for 33% of the CEOs in 100 largest enterprises on their own soil. So their control of managerial things, of course, was compounded by the fact that there is not a single DAX enterprise that had its headquarters in the East. Now, I could go on with more elite statistics, but I think we can see why West uh, East Germans in general perceive themselves as losers following the peaceful revolution. Now, I, in the latter part of the book, I'm sure this is the more controversial aspect, and I've had some negative West German reactions to this already. In no way do I attempt to downplay the authoritarian, dictatorial nature of the SED regime. In fact, as I moved through many of the concrete policies, at the end, I was shaking my head, realizing for the first time how absurd many of the elements of this system had been. But what I would argue is that it was oftentimes West German policies that put the SED regime on life support, that there were many Western policies that helped the regime to survive 10 years longer than it logically should have if we went by the economic statistics. First, I start with the process of Freikauf. Individuals associated with the Lutheran Church back in 1963 had approached the Adenauer government with a plan to liberate eight unjustly imprisoned East Germans in exchange for some goods to relieve scarcities afflicting average citizens. Over time, the CDU Minister for Inter-German Relations, Heiner Barzel, appointed a state secretary to head the government's special efforts and humanitarian efforts. Deals were arranged over the next 30 years by four key players who regularly met at expensive hotels in the West to arrange details after whining and dining, and all of this was without a paper trail. As of 1974, the proceeds that the SED regime was able to rake in because of buying out prisoners flowed into an account directly controlled by Eric Honecker at the Deutsche Handelsbank in East Berlin. By 19, the mid-70s, the GDR had reduced its wish list to four commodities, copper, silver, rough diamonds, and oil, all of which could immediately and easily be traded on foreign stock markets. Between 1963 and 1989, the FRG bought freedom for 33,755 individuals, many of whom by the 1980s were under the age of 25 for a total profit of 3.5 billion DMARCs. Initially set at the price of 40,000 DMARCs per person, the prisoner value rose over time to 95,847 DMARCs in the late 70s, and this continued through the 1980s. Now, only 100 million of this per year could actually be used for SED party needs. The rest stood as credit reserves to ensure the GDR's credit worthiness beyond the special loans it was getting uh, channeled through Hans Josef Strauss, et cetera. The resulting bank deposits by 19, December 1989 totaled over 2 trillion 105, 000, uh, 105 million D marks. The final payment, ironically, was made in June 1990 in the form of 1,034 VW buses for SED elites. 
I then move on to the individual chapters. And the first thing, because I only have about five to 10 minutes left, 10 minutes if I push it, right, Eric? Um, I start with writers, GDR writers and intellectuals who are, of course, they're loyalty bound uh, to the idea of the anti-fascist state, the new beginning, many of these people having come back from exile uh, under the Nazi regime. But as Solzhenitsyn once wrote, for a country to have a great writer is like having another government. That's why no regime has ever loved great writers, only minor ones. Now, this anti-fascist dilemma led many of these people to stay in Germany. I do provide profiles of Christoph Wolf and Stefan Heim, for example. But this kind of anti-fascist loyalty had disappeared by the time we got to the Prenzlauer Berg scene that was much more inclined to be apolitical and a-loyal. Its definition of exit was to pull away from the government altogether. The real dividing line for the generations, we like to think of the Prague Spring that was extremely important for those born into and all who came after. But another cutting uh, threshold was the Weltjugendfestspiele in the early 1970s that coincided with Eric Honecker, Eric Honecker taking charge, where everyone thought that there would be a liberalization and opening up because of Ostpolitik. And then there was another clamp down and that sort of permanently lost the loyalty, the systemic loyalty of younger citizens. The chapter on the Stasi pastors, dissidents, again, I bring in individual profiles, Hans, Missel, Hans and Ruth Misselwitz, uh, Jens Reich, things along, people along these lines. And I find that the, the pastors are the more interesting group, of course, because a number of them did go into politics, whereas the dissidents who thought they would be immediately incorporated into politics were shamelessly exploited during the first 10 years of unification in the form of the Bundestag commissions of inquiry, working through the history and consequences of the SED dictatorship in Germany. This also overlapped these inquiry commissions with the outright attack on GDR authors, Schriftsteller, but most importantly, all the criticisms, all the attacks on Christa Wolf, who for the record had received every single literature prize that East Germany as well as West Germany had to offer. The objective here was a political moral evaluation, but as we know now uh, in retrospect, the commission itself, the composition of the commission was highly biased, and so I don't need to go into more detail at that right now, in, in that case right now. But the people who had been considered winners under the old regime all became the immediate losers after unification and were never able to kind of restore their position. Whereas among the pastors, many of whom could, thought they were losers initially, became political winners, whereas the dissidents who thought they would be winners were outright losers as well by the end of the unification story. Now we turn to the chapter on women, and I talk about the shift from state paternalism to private patriarchy. We know that the whole negotiation process simply excluded women. This was the triumph of the fatherland, and it was trying to displace the Kinderküche Kombinat policies that the SED had instituted. Now, the SED leaders were in no way feminist. In fact, all of their policies supporting women were pro-natalist in nature. They did not have to recruit as many foreign guest workers, although there were about 190,000 from Vietnam, from uh, Morocco, and uh, from some of these other sort of rogue systems. But women immediately became losers after unification, not only because they were excluded from the core negotiations, but because the coal government set out to eliminate most of the benefits that allowed women to reconcile work and family, albeit as a double, triple burden. None of these policies ever sought to change the role definitions of men, childcare, legal abortion, mass unemployment. But if we wait it out a little bit to the point where Angela Merkel, the first woman Eastern chancellor, comes to power, aided by her minister mom sidekick, Ursula von der Leyen, what we find is a reinstatement of many of those policies, the guaranteed childcare, but reinstated in a way that now bring men into the picture and also focus not just on role equity, but role change. So that we have these women emerging as losers, but ultimately some 25 to 30 years later, women have become 
not only winners, but more importantly, it's the West German women who emerge in winners as winners because they never had these policies and had lobbied in vain for them for many, many years. But the, in the immediate past, the lesson for women in the GDR was more freedom equals fewer rights. Then we move on to the chapter of youth, leave us kids alone. The paradox we encounter here was that the SED persistently projected these assumptions of eternal childhood onto the adult population. Despite decades of party regulated socialization, it never treated its citizens as adults. They had to be led by the party 40 years after the division of the country, 28 years after the institution of the Berlin Wall. At the same time it treated its adult citizens as perpetual children, it insisted on treating children of all ages as political carbon copies of themselves, that is, as little grown-ups willing and able to adhere to the same rigorous ideological standards as state functionaries. As a result, their treatment of young citizens became ever more oppressive and ever more counterproductive over time. And this is where I have to come back to the idea of the Freikauf, because once the GDR discovered the buying out of prisoners as a new form of hard currency generation, they began to actually crack down a lot more on youth in the 1980s than they ever had in the 1970s. By the early 1980s, the authorities were transporting adolescents from local jails to Stasi prisons in Karl Marxstadt every 10 to 14 days. It was only then a matter of time before they would be bused to Cottbus, where 250 to 300 of these youth per year were then deported to the FRG. And so what you find are a lot more young people trying to escape, knowing they will land in prison, but hoping against hope, or more often than not, actually hoping not in vain, that they would then be bought out by Western Germany. So this is part of the process. Then I go through these individual youth groups. The other thing is that the GDR, Margaret Honecker, the Purple Dragon, who was the educational minister, also shamelessly exploited youth for production purposes. Youth brigades, their mandatory one to two days a month of going into production. Youth brigades grew from roughly 15,600 in 1971 to over 28,000 of these youth work brigades by 1976. FDJ initiatives, forcefully recruiting kids, particularly who wanted to go on to the gymnasium, were credited with saving 45 million work hours, generating 1 billion Eastmarks in profit. They collected over 307,000 tons of scrap, renovated 6,659 apartments, cut agricultural fodder costs by 13.8 mil, uh, 13 million East Marks, and they contributed, including Angela Merkel, 150,000 hours to liberating the Moritzbastei ruins in Leipzig to turn it into a kind of underground club. Merkel says that she put in well over 50 hours into that project while she was at the university. So we do have now youth coming out and assuming this kind of normative loyalty, where does this come from? How do I get this? I made extensive use. I was, to my knowledge, the first and last American ever allowed un unlimited access to data at the Central Institute for Youth Research in Leipzig. This was shortly after the fall of the wall prior to unification, and then the whole thing was upgevickled. And what is really astounding is that by 1986, not even 50% of the FDJ functionaries and the young SED members believed in the leading role of the Communist Party. So I then take, uh, make use of two longitudinal studies. The FDJ continued uh, some of their activities for a while as the researchers were spread out to other places, but there are two panel studies going all the way back to 1989, youth in Brandenburg as well as youth in Saxony, and I'm able to determine from the same sample of people, although it grows smaller over time, that by the 2015 period, 71% had experienced unemployment, 40% more than once, merely 7% 
now thought capitalism guaranteed freedom for all. Only 28% saw it upholding human rights. 74% had come to the conclusion not everything we learned about capitalism in school was wrong. And 62% with their old agreed with their old Stabu lesson that capitalists exploit their workers. Three decades later, those people said that the amount of time it would take to converge with the culture of West Germany would now take until 2040. That's 20 years longer than they had predicted back in the early 1990s. Chapter 11, the final chapter I will explore here, considers the double bind of masculinity in the GDR. Everybody talks about gender, but nobody ever talks about masculinity except for Louise Davidson Schmidt, who pointed this out to me a long time ago. The, if there's one way to make somebody hate the GDR or break with systemic loyalty, it is to make them serve their two years in the National Folks Army. There was a lot of abuse. There was a lot of hazing. And so they come out with this concept of hyper-masculinity. They're supposed to hate the enemy. They're supposed to want to kill, kill, kill. And then they're supposed to be go home and be caring partners and accept the emancipated status of women in their lives. The new socialist man was the kind of classical industrial worker. And so these people are subject to very different feelings of winning and losing. Let's face it, ultimately, they are the ones, the ones who've turned to the AFD, particularly in the early 2000s through 2010s. Those were people who thought by this age, in their 40s, and in particularly in their 50s and early 60s, they would have been the managers of the people's own factories. And they, they are constantly competing with West German men as the elite statistics demonstrate, who have never let them move up the ladder in ways that they consider to be appropriate for their status, their expertise, their training, et cetera. Turning to the last chapter, Was bleibt the dialectical identities of successor generations? Again, I find a lot of evidence here of the normative loyalty to the ideals, but let me turn now to conclude this with some of my reflections on the last part, coming to terms with uh, the East German past in West Germany. The fact that the official GDR identity was not widely embraced did contribute to the state's rapid demise. But here I take to task the West Germans, first of all, for their decades of indifference in the public at large, as well as among politicians, towards conditions inside the GDR. And if you don't think that this is real, then you could try my first book addressing West German identity. As Schneider had pointed out, the walk had created the illusion that the only thing separating the Germans of East and West for three decades was in fact the wall. For FRG citizens, quote, the wall became a mirror that told them day by day who was the fairest of the land, whether there was life on the other side of the death strip was something that sooner only interested pigeons and cats. Willy Brandt had pointed out that after the wall fell, yes, of course, that could grow now grow together, which belonged together. But people forgot what he said in the Bundestag on the day of unification or the day after unification itself. He brought that theme back in, but let me give you his quote. Ensuring economic rejuvenation and social security do not lie beyond our capacity for achievement. Bridging over the cognitive cultural inhibitions and spiritual psychological barriers will be more difficult. But with recognition and respect for the self perceptions of our compatriots who have long been separated from us, it will be possible to have that grow together which belongs together without disfiguring scars. And because these cognitive cultural differences, these are my words now, because the spiritual, cultural, psychological dimensions of unification were completely ignored for 30 years by West German politicians and pundits. In fact, the disfiguring scars have become ever more obvious over the last 10 years. So I will conclude here and say that sort of my larger lesson having relied heavily on the work of Alexander and Margarete Mitscherlich throughout my 40 years of East and West German research, 
more important than the ability to mourn is actually the ability to empathize, not die Fähigkeit zu trauern, sondern die Fähigkeit, sich in die Lage des anderen zu versetzen. So let me stop there. Thank you for your attention. And I can't wait to hear what the West German critique is, this is going to give me. All right. Um, thanks so much, Joyce. That was a, a terrific presentation. Um, so I see we already have a question in the box, so I'm going to get right uh, to it. Uh, this is from Dieter Detke. Uh, he sees your point about Ostdeutsche Identität, but it's still an artificial constructed identity. Let's not forget that the GDR was the product of Soviet Russian occupation, and that identity collapsed once the Russian occupation ended. Not much of Ostdeutsche Identität was left. Efforts to give substance to Ostdeutsche Identität, like adopting Prussia, had substance in reality. Well, my response to that is that, did you listen to the first part of my presentation? Because these East German identities I am considering are the identities of the Schriftsteller, the identities of the dissidents, the identities of the women, of the youth in each of these various subcultures. This is not DDR identity, identität as many people have been projecting onto the system. There is not one GDR, well, there was one GDR official identity, but there are multiple cross-cutting and sometimes conflicting Ostdeutsche Identitäten, and that is why I have looked at these processes, these values, these behaviors from the bottom up. Case in point, women's identities. Women were used to reconciling family and work. Women were economically independent. They had their own source of income. Women were, by the 1970s, the one initiating most of the divorces because they didn't need a man to sustain them. These identities were taken away from them with the elimination of daycare, with mass unemployment, with the recriminalization of abortion, Women's identities are very separate from the identities that were that the SED regime sought to impose. So all I can say is that reflects the title that is reflected in the title of the book. It is about the dialectical identities, not any singular identity that could be attributed to any one of these groups. So I, I have a question um, of my own that. Uh... I don't know, I was reminded of when Dieter mentioned Prussia, but in particular, I know that since unification, there was a lot of investment into regional identity with the recreation of um, Bundesländer in the uh, former territory of the GDR, and you know, quite a bit of investment in a Saxon identity or a Thuringian identity. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that are. Do you think that that um, has become a salient level of identity for, for Easterners, or has this Ostdeutsche Identität kind of made it very difficult for that regionalism to take over? Well, let me remind us all that the first people heading these states, Saxony, were Westerners, Biedenkopf, Bad Vogel, all right? They brought in Westerners. The only East German state that had an East German leader was Brandenburg with Manfred Stolpe. And that these governments were also rife with corruption, even Biedenkopf, uh, King, Biedenkopf, King Kurt had to leave because of a scandal, a self-imposed scandal. So the, the recreation of states, the attempt to use that as a basis, didn't really come across with the possible exception of Saxony, because the, but the Leipzigers have a very separate identity from Dresden have a very separate, and, and people always do this when they feel oppressed from above, they recultivate their identities from below. I remember on the occasion of the 750th birthday of Berlin, where the SED was putting together this big thing, and then they brought back Martin Luther and all this kind of stuff. And there was a bumper sticker they had put out in Erzgebirge and said, you know, 750 years Berlin, 1,600 years of Erzgebirge. So these local identities, people identified first and foremost with the city, with their own little region, 
uh, in Cottbus, the miners, you know, had the same kind of strong personal identities that miners in Britain used to have before Maggie Thatcher destroyed many of those unions and shut down a lot of their activities. So I think it's always a kind of from the bottom up identity. And people, I like these little identities because that gave them a way to reject the SED imposed identity. And it was their sort of resistance, their sort of take this pushback against an identity that most of them did not want to internalize. So I also want to pick up, um, so you mentioned on a couple of occasions that there's a connection between the male worker subculture in the DDR and current levels of support for the AFD. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you just explore that connection just a little bit more, um, and especially because it seems that the AFD's traction is coming from their anti-immigration, yes. anti-multicultural yes. uh, anti stance. I mean, mm -hmm. I, also, I also know that, you know, they're, they're not supportive of too many women's rights or the LGBT community, but it seems that immigration is the, is the real issue. So can you explore a little bit more um, that connection? Yes, I well, and it's a it's a profound question, and we could probably talk about this over three beers at least. But one of the first things I would stress is let's not forget the AFD was founded by a West German economist. The initial issue was about the euro, and then after the as as the migration floods began to flow after the failure of Arab Springs, then suddenly they kind of found a new cause. The AFD split had seven different leaders. If we look now to the leadership of the AFD. Jaren Herke is a Westerner. Gauland is a Westerner. Weiland is a Westerner. Okay. So uh, it was Westerners who were using this as an opportunity because they would have been the neocons. They would have been the hardliners. They would have been the Freedom Caucus in the Western CDU. And they found this as a, as a new basis for their own activities, et cetera. Now, if I take this group the at least the, the statistics from around 2014, 2016, the core voters for AFD in the East, don't forget Baden-Württemberg and North Rhine-Westphalia in 2016, along with Sachsen-Anhalt, also got double digits for the first time for the AFD. But if I look to that period over in the East, these are men who are sort of late 40s to early 60s. By 65, the support for the AFD really falls off significantly because Merkel helped to improve the pensions and things along those lines. Now, let's go back to Rostock. Let's go back to Hoyerswerda. And if we take those kids who were sort of, you know, 16, 18, maybe 22 back in 1990, we add 30 years to that, what age group do we get? All right, so these are people who were left behind. 4.1 million left the GDR, but most of those who left the Eastern states were better educated women. So actually one AFD voter said to Petra Köping, the social minister in Saxony, if you find me a wife, I will stop voting for the AFD. Literally, she told me that in person, okay? So you've got these men who feel like a lot of life chances have passed them by. What this doesn't explain is in the more recent Sachsen-Anhalt election, why suddenly there was a surge in AFD voting among 18 to 25 year old men. Here's a problem because these 18 to 25 year old men were not socialized in the GDR. They've attended Western norm schools. They are working for Western employers if they're lucky enough to have these jobs. So you have to explain to me what has gone wrong with the Western educational system that can reproduce these people who have these kinds of resentments. And now we turn back to the more recent Western elections, and we also find in Hessen a surge for the AFD. So something is rotten in Denmark, but that something is not concentrated, to mix a metaphor, in the Eastern lender. So it's, it's this kind of relative deprivation. It's the sense that life is passing them by. And you've got exactly the same mentality voting for the crazies in Iowa, in Texas, in Nevada. The feeling that life has passed them by and they're being denied certain opportunities that they automatically assume would be theirs. All right, here's a question from John Torby. 
How could anyone as well informed as Teo Zoma have said have have said what he said that there was no DDR identity? Anyone who had talked to people in the GDR by its last years would have recognized immediately a very different set of sensibilities. You suggest a difference between Staatsidentität and, and pure culture identities, but was Zoma duped by totalitarianism theories that turned people in Eastern Europe into zombies? That view was widespread in the West. I don't think he was duped, but I think at the time the common feeling was this the state identity that as soon as the wall is gone and as soon as the SED octogenarians are out of here, we will then be the kind of people we always or Westerners assume we always wanted to be. I really don't think he was duped, but do I do uh, ask you to think about the fact that uh, Theo Sommer and Marianne Griefen Dernhof and they, they had a group of six or seven people who did their little tour of Eastern Germany. This is around 1984, 85. But their meetings, more often than not, were with SED officials. They had all kind. yes, they could kind of go through the cities, but they were never really on their own, didn't spend a lot of time drinking beer in the local uh, Kneipe. So I, I just think it was too easy for West Germans to assume that there was this official East German identity and you bought it or you didn't. Because if they had read my book on West Germany, I also have different identities based on generations, the the sort of pan-German that, that experienced the war identities. The most confused group tended to be the baby boomers who had a no good, I, no national identity is a good national identity orientation, or don't talk to me about Deutsche Identität, I'm a European, or I'm a peacenik, so I believe in universal citizenship. And then I got down to the younger generation, those people who were teens and university students in there in the early 1980s who said, you know, you got to have a passport from somewhere in order to take advantage of our six weeks of, of paid vacation. So they were kind of pragmatic, no big deal federal Republicans. So I think that they didn't see all the different identities in their own society, which makes it harder to imagine very differentiated identities on the other side. I have so many other questions I want to ask uh, Joyce. I, 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 I think I would like to evade the you know West German angle just a little bit. Um, although it does seem that you um, afford most of the agency and most of the responsibility for what went wrong in Eastern Germany to Western decisions. But I'm wondering, you know, as, as you rightfully mentioned, there is a massive Eastern diaspora in parts of the West today, right? I think you said over 4 million people. That sounds about right to me as well. And I'm, I'm wondering if your research looked at that group at all and how they kind of um, relate to an east to their east eastern germanness or to this you know east german identity that's what i do in the final chapter but of course i'm dependent on those people who actually write or say something about it and so i look at the uh the born into generation the alexander osang daniela don christoph diekmann uh, people who were who grew up who had a, a very strong sense of Eastern identity who then get jobs uh, working for Die Zeit or Der Spiegel who find they're allowed to they're supposed to be the cultural interpreters they're supposed to offer they keep getting singled out you know it's like you're the the only person of color in the room so they expect you to write about the race riots or what have you whenever there's an East German issue coming up they would pinpoint these people. But then they found oftentimes that they weren't allowed to tell some of the personal stories that their editors would say, no, 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 the, our Western readers won't understand that. So they kind of move aside because they're aging. And then the Dritte Generation Ost, people like Jana Hensel and Susanna Renefans, they start writing about their childhoods because what they're noticing is that even though they feel integrated in Western society, and they, they may even have Western partners and they have children of their own. They suddenly, everybody at the cocktail party is talking about some cartoon they watched as a kid. And they realize they don't know anything about those cartoons because they were watching Zantmentian. They were watching very different cartoons in the GDR. So they had more of a curiosity. And they're going back because their identity is only secondhand, that which they had learned from their parents and grandparents. And the third generation, the uh, Nachwendejugend, um, uh, 
Veronica, whose last name currently escapes me, who's also writing occasionally pretty tight. You know, they're going back and trying to find the, some of the positive things in the GDR. And they are getting hammered by these older white Western male pundits writing for the Funk for the Allgemeine, you know, trashing their books and saying it's just a bunch of nostalgia and things along these lines. So I think this group, they even have a research group going on where they're going back and looking for positive things that are now there in the East that might bring more of these people back. And in fact, there is some trend, there's no statistical disaggregated statistics on this, but there is some trend for people who've been educated in the West to eventually return back to Eastern cities because they've got family there. There are more child care centers. You know, 65% of the, of the demand that is not being fulfilled for child care places is in the Western states. The Eastern states have it covered up to about 89, 89 to 90%. So if they are generally moving back, they feel like, they want to be in a place that has some comfort and they're smaller cities. They can afford to live there, things along those lines. So there, yes, there is some evidence, but it's only qualitative anecdotal kind of evidence. All right. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I want to kind of press you on this point for a sec. And I guess this will probably be our last uh, question because we are almost at, at time kind of thing. I mean, I, I, I agree with your arguments entirely, but it did seem to me that you that that so many of the groups, at least by today's uh, or in in today's context, were as you put it, the losers of you know unification. And you know the the working class men feel the sense of disappointment, as you rightfully pointed out, that they didn't get what they thought they would, and everything like that. But what about the Easterners who have won from reunification? And I mean, according to some estimates, about a third of the East German population is doing great, right? Maybe not on the higher echelons of business or public administration, but, you know, there's lots of, you know, small business owners, for instance, that, that have done quite well. You know, to what, did the great, to what degree do they feel um, Eastern German? Or is it just those that have really, you know, had a tough time since unification? No, no, no. I would argue they definitely feel Eastern German. And if they're having successful business experiences by starting new companies or little firms in the East, they're staying there for a reason. They're staying there because they feel that is their home. That's the place where they can share values and where they have sort of norms of social interaction in common with other people there. The problem with that group, if you're looking for the success, that would require a whole different range of interviews that I was not in a position to carry out 35 years ago, 32 years ago, when I started this project, because I had done all these interviews with members of the newly freely elected Volkskammer, including Angela Merkel, Joachim Gauch, and then I can only, after that point, I'm forced to rely on, if not surveys, but personal memoirs and, and things that people themselves have written or my own conversations with people. I'm not saying that only the losers have an East German identity. I'm saying that the, large, the experience of a particular subgroup was never constant. Some could be winners at this point and then perceive themselves as losers later. Some could perceive themselves or were losers and then suddenly feel themselves winners now. That, that's why we've got the dialectic. These identities are lost, found, reconfigured in a variety of ways, depending on what policies and what personal experiences kind of come together for them. All right. Well, that's a wonderful note to um, end our discussion. Um, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm joined by everybody here in thanking you, Joyce, for taking the time today to share your, um, you know, fascinating and exciting uh, and, um, I guess, uh, long in the works book. So, um, you know, thanks. And we'll, we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. Cheers.